I got a, got a weekend off last week. You might have known that. Um, and just thanks again to uh, Mark Benedem for, uh, for sharing God's word. Can we just give him another hand? It was just fantastic. And so um, as I got back online early in the week, um, I was greeted with something kind of unusual. So let's, let's put this up on the screen. I got a number of you sent me something about this. Because, see, apparently in this past week, there have been... Uh, Somebody out there in uh, internet world um, is, has, uh, is impersonating me to scam people. So I don't know if you can see, the, see in this lower one right here. There we go. Um, you know, this is an email address that looks a lot like my actual email address, but it is not. Not at all. And, and so apparently I sent something up, you know, that looked a little bit like this, um, which... And, and if you follow up with that, they're trying to get you to, to send gift cards to money and stuff like this. So it's obviously and completely a scam. But here's the part that I was, was kind of cool, I guess, about that. Even though, unfortunately, because it's a completely fake email address, I could do nothing to stop it other than just let people know that it was going on. Is that, to the best of my knowledge, nobody got fooled by it. I had a number of people that actually contacted me, but, here's, but here's, here's why they didn't get fooled. And this is actually really ties in closely to why we need to look at this passage today. Do you know why they didn't get fooled? Because that does not sound like me. That does not sound like me. That's not how, not how I ask people for help or to do things. I don't use that kind of a tone. And, and those who know me, they... They picked up on that right away, and so I got all these texts like, hey, I think, I think somebody's, uh, think you've got some scam emails going out, and they started sending me stuff like this, because they knew. It reminds me, see, you know, the, the, you know, like there's a passage in John that talks about how the sheep know the shepherd's voice. When you know somebody, when somebody is a friend, when they're a close friend, you know what they sound like, and so it is easier, it is so much easier to identify the fake and that's where this passage is going to take us today. Don't get fooled by the fakes. Don't get fooled by the fakes. Because we're going to head into, uh, this is probably, you know, if, for those of you that got excited about, hey, we're going to be in the book of Revelation, this might be because of, of this passage this week. Because we're going to be in Revelation chapter 13 and 14, and I strongly encourage you to have your Bibles open, even if you have to use, like, you know, find one on your phone and scroll through that way to follow along, strongly encourage you to have, the, have God's word open today because we're going to be in probably the most misunderstood, most feared, most controversial, most, I mean, it's often used to coerce and bring fear. And I want you to understand it. I want you to understand it. And in particular, and because maybe... Maybe you, you're like uh, I've been often with the book of Revelation. You're like, this is, a, this is a dark passage. This is scary and weird, and I'd rather avoid it. I understand that. I understand that. Um, but there's a reason why it's important for us at times to take some, to go even into these dark passages, these hard passages, because, here, here's the second, is because Jesus is there. In fact, Jesus is the key to the entire Bible. If you know Jesus, you know how to understand all these other aspects of the scriptures. And so I want us, even in these, because we're going to be in some dark stuff today. So just telling you that. It's a, it, but I want us to be able to identify Jesus in those places that on the surface, the, you know, we might be, get so caught up in just you know, how, how, you know, how much violence is going on in this passage or the bloodshed or everything just looks chaotic and out of control and crazy and hard. But the, the ability to find Jesus in those scary places is a skill that we need to develop, especially right now. Amen. Because Jesus is there. He's there in every situation, even in the middle of a pandemic, even in the middle of civil and social and political unrest and uncertainty and global economics and all the stuff. He's right there. He's right there. And what we need to do is we want to build a resilient faith is we need to be able to identify as Christians. We need to lock our eyes on how he's there because he's there. All right. So, um, oh, I should point out, um, we're also going to... Um, 
We have a, dis we have, there's a Facebook discussion group uh, that's dedicated to the book of Revelation. And yeah, if you're, if you're watching online, you can see it on the screen. If you go to our Facebook page, click the big blue button. How do I get there? Click the blue button. That's how you get there. You'll find it pretty easily. And um, uh, I'll be there on uh, tonight. Actually, we'll put a Zoom link. Let's take that screen down for a sec. We'll put a Zoom link up. And so we can have some face-to-face -face conversation. There's also, you know, opportunities to just ask questions, all those kind of things. And I also should point out that, I mean, even going through the series, I, I'm not interested in you agreeing with me lockstep. I, like, that's not, the, that's not the point. But what I am trying to do is help all of us to, to get into God's Word together and have the tools to understand it so we can, we can apply it to our lives and fall in love with Jesus even more. So if you disagree with me on things... That's great. And especially in the book of Revelation, there are things where like Jesus-loving, Bible-trusting Christians have come to really honest differences of opinion. And so yeah, if you disagree with me on things, we're fine. We're fine. But let's be in the Word. Let's be in the Word together. That's where we have Christian conversation. Not just opinion, but like, what's actually in the Word? Where is it written? How goes your walk? Let's talk about it. Um, and so even today uh, in the message, there's going to be a few things. I've been hitting on a few big themes and try to, try, to, try to hit big on the big things. But I'm also going to talk about a few elements that are going to be a little more speculative. And um, frankly, there's one piece here that I'm going to talk about where I just deeply hope I'm wrong. Okay? So if you... If you come at the same passage as we look at the, the latter part of chapter 14 and you're like, no, 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 just, I will applaud. That's great. You disagree. Awesome sauce. Okay. So, um, so again, the point isn't to get all of us in, in total agreement on everything, but the point is to get us, get us into the word and to be aware of the big picture, the big, big themes of the book of Revelation. Because here's, here's the bedrock truth under all of it. Jesus wins. Amen. And we're going to keep coming back to this theme. It's, uh, yeah, you can go ahead and clap, you know, because spoiler alert, you know, if you haven't read the book yet. But, but he wins. And here's the other part that you need to know, and we need to understand in the depths of our being, it's not even a fair fight. Amen. Not even a fair fight. This isn't, this isn't like Star Wars, and we don't know if the rebels are going to blow up the Death Star. Or even far more important, this isn't even like D-Day, and we don't know whether or not the Allies are going to take the beach at Normandy. We don't know that. The, the, it's, it's not like, the book of Revelation is not like that. The book of Revelation is about the finite, limited powers of evil having their very final say before the infinite goodness of God eradicates evil from the world forever. So we got to understand that as we head into the book. Now, chapter 13 follows chapter 12, and uh, we looked at this around Christmas. It's, a, it's this vision of the dragon, Satan, who has now been hurled to earth. He's been banished from heaven. He's pursuing the woman and the child. Michael and the angels are fighting, and, and they're winning. Christians are part of that victory by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. So this is connected to the same vision. There's this vision that the dragon with represents Satan. And then we get to chapter 13. And um, uh, we're going we're gonna to be reading a lot of scripture today. So we'll put some things up on full screen and then we'll talk about it a little bit. But anyways, here we go. Chapter 13, let's open up the word together. Continuation of the same vision. The dragon stood on the, on the shore of the sea and I saw a beast. Beast number one, coming up out of the sea. He had ten horns, seven heads, with ten crowns on its horns, and on each head a blasphemous name. The beast I saw resembled a leopard, and, but had feet like those of a bear, and a mouth like that of a lion. The dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. The whole world was filled with wonder and followed the beast. People worshipped the beast because he had given authority to the beast, and they also worshipped the beast, and they asked, Who is like the beast? Who can wage war against it? The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemy and to exercise its authority for 42 months. It opened its mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. It was given power to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them. And it was given authority over every tribe, people, 
language, and nation. All inhabitants on the earth will worship the beast, all whose names have, note this, not, have not been written in the Lamb's book of life, the Lamb who was slain from the creation of the world. Okay, quick pause there. So we see in this passage that, that the world gets divided into fundamentally two categories of people. There are those who have been marked by the Lamb. So, so they have the seal of God on their foreheads. We see about this in Revelation chapter 3, verse 12, 7, verse 3. They have the name of God written on them. They're written in the Lamb's book of life. These are different ways of expressing the same thing. People will belong to Jesus. And if they belong to Jesus, then, then they cannot ultimately come under the authority of Satan. Okay? Now, Satan can harass them. Satan can, Satan can make a big mess in their life, but, um, but there are fundamentally two groups of people. Those under the, under the seal, the mark, the authority of Christ, and those who are now vulnerable to the mark and authority and worship of the beast. Because God, in, as we've been looking through the book of Revelation, this is, God is, is removing his hands of protection on the earth. All these things that we, we kind of take for granted in the ways that he is working in the world, he's removing his hands of protection and, and letting the evil that is already present in the world come into its full effect so it can be fully revealed, so it can be fully removed. It's being fully revealed here. And so... Moving on, verse 9. Whoever has ears, let them hear. If anyone is to go into captivity, into captivity, they will go. If anyone is to be killed with the sword, with the sword, they will be killed. And then, now, if you've got your Bibles out and you've got the ability to highlight a phrase, I'd like you to highlight this phrase. So what do we do with all this stuff, all this, this beast stuff, and this, some people are going to get captured, some people are going to get killed, what do we do with this? What's the right response? This calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of God's people. Okay? Underline that if you can. Okay. Okay, quick, quick pause. So, so who is the first, who's the first beast? Let's, let's, pull, let's take down the passage for a second there. There we go. So who is the first beast? So this is... We're, we're going to see in this. We, we're we're going to see in, this, in essence this unholy trinity emerging. You've got the dragon, who is remember Satan. Okay. Now we've got the first beast. This beast, this sea beast, this seven seven headed, ten horns, ten crowns. There's a sea beast. There's a sea beast that that that, that emerges. That's the first, and then we're going to meet the second one. You know, they, they've, they've actually he's actually got a buddy. You know, that's that's going to emerge pretty soon. But so who is the first beast? Who is the first beast? Now, it's helpful for us to understand how, uh, well, the early church would hear that. And it's helpful for us to look a couple of chapters ahead in Revelation where it actually tells us who that first beast is. So let's just quickly go there. Revelation 17, uh, 9 through 11. This calls for a mind of wisdom. The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. And the woman ends up being Babylon, Babylon the great city. Anyway, okay. there are also seven kings. Five have fallen. One is, and the other has not yet come. But when he does come, he must remain for only a little while. The beast who once was and now is not is the eighth king. He belongs to the seven and is going to his destruction. Okay, so let's, let's, let's just come back. So to the early church, the early church, this, this, this first beast, this seven-headed beast is very, very, like they would have very, very, very clearly heard this as, as a reference to Rome. Very clearly. Seven, Rome is a city, the city that was, at this point, was the, the superpower of the world. And in the center of the city were seven hills. And the legend of Rome is it was founded by seven kings. Google that. Google that. Google the seven hills of Rome. Google it. Okay? So the early church, they would have heard this. Rome, the beast, the beast, 
is Rome. And even you, there was a legend going around right around this time, around AD 95, that Nero, the emperor that had died in about 68, that he had actually come back to life. Now, realize we are not the first generation to have invented fake news. We just do it better than everyone else. I mean, like, we are so stinking fast at it. But it, didn't, it happened back then, too. And, you'd have, and you have emperors who lie and people who spread false, you know, false information in order to get ahead politically. It happened in Rome, too, amazingly enough, because people are people, and the, and the human heart hasn't changed very much, or at all. So, anyway, so we need to understand that. The, the early church, who at very least, would have heard you know, they're hearing about this first beast, they would, have, they would realize this beast, this beast is Rome. Okay, let's carry on. Uh, uh, verse 11. Then I saw a second beast. Oh, there's a second beast. The beast has a buddy. He came out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb. Hmm. But he spoke like a dragon. Looked like a lamb. He talked like a dragon. Fake lamb. That's what he is. It's a dragon lamb. Don't listen to no dragon lamb. That's a fake lamb. Fake email. Don't answer the email, people. It exercised all the authority of the first beast on its behalf, and it made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast, whose fatal wound had been healed, and it performed great signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven to the earth in full view of the people. He could do great tricks. Okay, because of the signs it was given power to perform on behalf of the first beast, it deceived the inhabitants of the earth. Not all of them. Because remember, some of them were sealed. But deceived the inhabitants of the earth and ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. The second beast was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast so the image could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. It also forced all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hands or on their foreheads so that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the person who has insight calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. That number is six, six, six. Okay, quick pause. So we, now, now we've got the full unholy trinity, the third member of the unholy trinity, has emerged. Who, a little bit like the Holy Spirit, points to Jesus, who points us to God. Yeah, this, he is, uh, the, the second beast is pointing to the first who is operating and in, in, in moving people under the authority of the dragon, who is Satan. Now, it's, it's helpful for us to think again about how this passage would have been understood by the early church, okay? So you, you got to imagine, how the, as these churches are getting this letter, this, this, this incredible prophecy from John, and through John. I mean, they were scattered throughout the empire. They were living in the shadows of the Roman temples, where the emperors of Rome were increasingly being worshipped as gods. And local municipalities were increasingly orienting civic life around the temples, and we're told that in this process that some of the merchants in some of the cities that by this point, that they couldn't enter the primary market of the village unless they had first offered sacrifices at the temple. So in other words, if, uh, if you want to get ahead in your business, if you, if you want to get to the main market, if you, if you want to really sell goods, then you need to bow down and worship the Roman gods and the Roman Caesars or you will not prosper. Now, a, a lot has been made about the, the, the number 666, and at least one of, now this is not a perfect, uh, you know, th there, there are people who rightly question this. But see, the, in the, the Hebrew system, there, it's called, um, there, uh, it's called uh, gematria, this idea that every letter would have a corresponding numeric value. Okay? And if you transliterate the phrase... Nero Caesar from Greek into Hebrew and use that well-established number system, guess what number you get? 666. Six, six, six. Again, so again, so here's, here's the thing that we need to understand is the early church, as they would have heard this, 
Here's what they would have likely concluded, is that, that Satan, the dragon, is using the Roman Empire, the first beast, to advance his causes by causing people to worship the Roman gods and the Roman emperors, and is using local cities and local leaders, the second beast, to coerce people into compliance by requiring them to worship in the Roman temple or to face personal economic disaster or much worse. That's likely what they would have heard. And uh, we do know that the early church, they, they wrestled with some of the moral complexity of this stuff in books like 1 Corinthians. You know, we, we see and Christians trying to wrestle between, you know, so if we get, if there's meat that's been offered in the temple, and again, it gets offered to me, can I eat it? If I eat it, am I compromised? They're trying to figure all those, all those things out. But see, passages like this, they help us to clarify what's going on in their world. See, even though there were, there were going to be some areas where, for lack of a better word, there's sort of some gray, they're trying to figure it out, do we do this? this? This was a passage, among others, that helped to draw a really clear line in the sand for the early church. So whatever you do with, you know, some of the, you know, the, the cheap chicken that can come out of the temples or however you engage with the culture around you, here's one thing you must not do. You must not do. You must not bow down. You must not bow down to that false god. And now remember in the, in the Bible, there's, I mean, there, there's, a, there's a long history of, of this kind of coercion happening. You think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the, in the Babylonian exile, and, and Nebuchadnezzar sets up, a, sets up an image in his, in his name and tells all people to bow down, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they know that if they don't bow, they're, they, they're going to get thrown into a fiery furnace, but they don't. This is the line. They know very, very clearly this is the line. This is, this is what we must not do. This is what we may not, where we may not go. No matter what happens, you must, we must stand firm. Do not worship the beast, no matter what it might cost you. So, what does that mean for us today? Um, see, er every era has had its speculations about the mark of the beast, hasn't it? Now, if you've been in church world for a while, you've probably heard a long list of some of those kinds of, of speculations. So what, is, it the, is it the UPC code that came out on food? Is it your cell phone? Is it, is, is it when you, is, was it credit cards? Is it if you get a tattoo? You remember hearing, if some of you growing up, you heard that. If you get a tattoo, it's like you're getting the mark of the beast. You know, remember here, it's just like a forehead or hand tattoo. And like... If you're going to get a forehead tattoo, think about this really, really clearly, okay? Really clearly. At very least, make sure you've used spell check, okay? At very least, if you want to have, if you want to have a, like a, a, a good kind of moral wake up, Google the phrase face tattoo fail, and I promise it will be interesting, okay? So, so we've, we've heard of all these different kinds of things, um, and... Um, and, well, well, including in recent days, um, just because I, I want to make sure I'm, just, I'm, being, I'm being bold and clear and honest, even in recent days, people talking about, hey, the vaccine. You get the COVID vaccine, you're getting the mark of the beast. And so Christians, tender-hearted, beautiful, tender-hearted Christians go, you know, in every area, they're like, okay, I just don't want to, I don't want to get the mark. I don't, I don't want to, what, what's going to go on here? So I, I want to I address a little bit about, of that today. Okay. Is to remember your salvation was not dependent on your good works. It wasn't dependent on you getting every single thing right. The only thing you needed to get right is you need to know who made things right for you. That 2,000 years ago, Jesus would be executed on a Roman cross in payment for your and my and our sin. And, and as we receive that as a gift, the righteousness of God gets imputed onto our lives. We are seen as righteous and holy and blameless before God entirely because of Jesus. 100% because of Jesus. It's not because of you. Not because of your talent or good looks or good decision making or discernment or every, any good move that you would make. Your salvation is strong because it does not depend on you. It depends on Jesus, realize this also, church, because here's the thing. I don't want you to live in fear. I do want you to live in discernment. 
See, your salvation is, is strong. It is because of Jesus. You cannot lose your salvation easily either. It's not, a, not because of one false move or one bad decision or one unwise choice. Or it, You're not going to trip over the mark of the beast. It's not going to just happen to you by accident. Though I would strongly recommend that you carefully think through, don't accept every credit card offer in your life, and you really Please don't get a forehead tattoo. It's just dumb, okay? Don't do that. You know, think about the vaccines you receive and, you know, read the medical research and all this stuff. And if, you know, if, you, if somebody's trying to give you a vaccine and it's from a mason jar in a back alley, don't do that, okay? That's just dumb. That's dumb. Don't do that. But your salvation does not depend on it. It does not depend on it. Jesus is not that fragile. So I don't want you to live in fear, but I do want you to live in discernment. Because there will be moments in our lives where we are called to decide and to choose who do you belong to? Who do you place your trust in? And those moments will be clear. But they will be hard. Don't worry so much about the one false move, but do ver worry very much about the drift. Jesus says, if you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. So be concerned about the quality of your prayer life. About what, what your heart longs for, the affections of your heart. Don't let your heart drift away from Jesus. So don't live in fear, Christian. But be discerning. But be discerning. Satan cannot snatch your mark away. You know why? Because Jesus is stronger. So you're not going to trip over the mark. It's not going to just happen to you by accident. The only way it can happen is if you give it away. So guard your heart. Guard your heart. Guard your heart. Know who you belong to. Know who you're living for. Know whose mark you are under. If you belong to Jesus, if you've given your heart to him, if you've trusted him for your salvation, you are sealed by the Holy Spirit. And Satan cannot ultimately touch you. He can harass you plenty, but he cannot ultimately touch you because you belong to Jesus and Jesus always wins. And Revelation is not a fair fight. Revelation is the story of the infinite goodness of God eradicating the finite, desperate, Coercive. Tricks. Tr trickery? No, I, I, no, I need to come up with the right adjective. But, but destroying evil. Stay with Jesus. Stay with Jesus. You have nothing to fear, but stay with Jesus. But stay with Jesus. So chapter 13 tells us about the, the dragon and the beast and Satan's tactics. Chapter 14, we're going to go there too, is all about the lamb and his response. And, and here's the part where we're going to, uh, let's, before we put this up, I, I want to give just a little disclaimer. This is the controversial part. Okay, here, here's the part where we're going to get into some nuts and bolts. And you might disagree with me on some things, and I will welcome that. That is fantastic. Okay. Then I looked. Uh, 14, 1. And there before him was a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him was 144,000. So you remember maybe back from chapter 7, 144,000 listed there. So this might have been a literal 144,000. This might have been symbolic of that international multitude. Not sure. But he had his name and his father's names written on their forehead. They were marked. And I heard the sound from heaven like the roar of rushing waters and like a loud peal of thunder. The sound I heard was like that of harpists playing their harps. And they sang a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders. No one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. 
These are those who did not defile themselves with women, for they remained virgins. They followed the Lamb wherever He goes. They were purchased from among mankind and offered as first fruits to God and the Lamb. No lie was found on their mouths. They are blameless. Let's talk about that for a minute because a few parts in there, a little bit confusing. Okay. Here's what, so so what's, with this, what's with this virginity thing? Let's talk about that for a second. Now, here's what I think is going on. I could be wrong. But do you remember back in the story of David and Bathsheba? And uh, so David, and David has coerced Bathsheba. It's, this, it's probably a very abusive situation. But anyways, he slept with Bathsheba. She's now pregnant. He's trying to cover it up. And so he calls Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, back from the front lines and, and, and says, hey, Uriah, why don't you have a little wink, wink, nudge, nudge? Why don't you have some family time before you go back, um, why, before you go back to, the, to the battlefield? And what does Uriah do? Nothing. He doesn't go home. Because, see, in, in, the, in the Old Testament, one of the ways that the soldiers would prepare themselves for battle is they would, is they would for a time, they would abstain. Even, even married soldiers would abstain as a, as, a, as a way of signifying kind of moral, their, their moral purity, their readiness for battle. What I think is going on here is this is a reference to, to the, these people, whether this is the literal 144,000 or with, whether this 144,000, like we talked about a few weeks ago, is symbolic of people from every tribe, race, race nation, and tongue, all of whom have been redeemed by the Lamb. But this, this, is, they, they, this is a statement of their moral purity and their readiness for battle. But let's remember this. Where does that purity come from? Who gave it to them? They have been washed by the blood of the... Who is? So, so where, where does their, where does their um, who, has who has made them pure? It is. Who has purchased them for God? It is. Who is offering them as first fruits? It is. Who has made them blameless? So Jesus has prepared this group of people. He's prepared this group of people for, for something pretty important. This is how the lamb does battle. We've already seen how the beast does battle. It's through coercion and power and, and, try, and trying, to, trying to intimidate. We've learned how the beast fights. How does the lamb respond? Okay. Then we're going to move into verse 6. Verse 6. Then I saw another angel flying in midair, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and tongue. He said in a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory because the hour of judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. A second angel followed and said, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. He made all the nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteries. A third angel followed him and said in a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives its mark on the forehead or on their hands, they too will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. They will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever. There will be no rest day or night for those who worship the beast and its image for anyone who receive or or for anyone who receives the mark of its name this calls for patient endurance on the part of the people of God who keep his commands and remain faithful to Jesus then i heard a voice from heaven say write this blessed are the dead who die in the lord from now on yes says the spirit they will rest from their labors for their deeds will follow them. Okay, let's, let's pause here. First thing I want us to note about this passage, this, this is one among so many places in the book of Revelation, even in the midst of this horrific scene of judgment, where we see the grace and love of God. Now, this is the final point in the book of Revelation where, where there are still Christians on the earth. This is the moment where, there, where, where any remaining Christians are about, to, are about to depart. It's about to happen. And we're going to look at how, how it likely happens. But I want you to see something there. It's right up to the very last second. To the very last second. God gives people a chance to turn. You know Why? Because God, look at me, come on. Let me see your eyes. Because God 
on the screen. You go ahead and look at the screen, okay? Because God loves people. God loves people. The, the whole story of Jesus is ultimately a rescue mission, and the whole story of, of, the, of the book of Revelation is ultimately a redemption mission because God loves people. And he is going to go to great lengths, to even up to the last second, to the final second, to those who have done everything to try to push him away, to try to deny him, to try to, de to deny the truth, to try to erase God from their life and their world, who have told him to go away. He's going to give them right up to the last possible second a chance to repent and turn. God is there even in the darkest of moments. If you have a heartbeat, you have a chance. And then, now we're going to move into the passage, the part of the passage where um, I desperately hope I'm wrong. Okay? It says, to those remaining Christians, this calls for patient endurance on the part of the people of God. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this, blessed are the dead who will die in the Lord from now on. And then we finish off chapter 14 with verse 14. And I looked and there before me was a white cloud. And seated on the cloud was one like the son of man. And a crown of gold on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. And another angel came out of the temple and called in a loud voice to him who was seated on the throne, take your sickle and reap, because the time to reap has come. For the harvest of the earth is ripe. And here, so he who was seated on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth and the earth was harvested. Another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. And another angel who had charge of the fire came from the, alt came from the altar and called in a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, take your sharp sickle and gather the cl clusters of grapes from the earth's vine, because its grapes are ripe. The angel swung his sickle on the earth, gathered its grapes, and threw them into the great winepress of God's wrath. They were trampled in the winepress outside the city, where was Jesus crucified? Outside the city. And the blood flowed out of the press, rising as high as the horse's bridles for a distance of 1,600 stadia. Now here's the part where I, I kind of hope I'm wrong. So if you disagree with me, we are fine, okay? But I think this is, this is, this is a prophetic warning and telling the church to be ready that in the very final moments, for those Christians that aren't raptured up, um, and you know, we, we looked in um, you know, chapter, um, chapter 11, at, what if, if you believe in the mid-trib rapture, where that would likely happen after the great proclamation at the gates at the, at the, at the temple, this may be a prophecy of God allowing there to be a massive martyrdom event. A massive martyrdom event. Perhaps like the one that is foretold in Revelation chapter 6 verses 9 through 11, wait a little longer until the full number of martyrs. Maybe that. It may be that. And again, I, I kind of hope I'm wrong. But I do know this. See, the beast fights through, through coercion. He fights, fights through intimidation and power and lies. He's really good at it. And the lamb wins every time. And the lamb wins through sacrifice. So if you disagree with me, we're fine. But let's talk about it tonight if you'd like. But for a moment, moment, just roll this around in your mind. Just in case I am right. And this is a prophecy about a potentially at the end of the, at the, just before Jesus returns, because this is the last time where Christians are mentioned in any form in the book of Revelation, right up until the day of judgment where the, where the, the dead in Christ ri you know, rise and everybody stands before the judgment seat of God. We're going to be there in two weeks looking at that. This is the final time in Revelation where there are any believers on, the, on, the, on, on planet Earth that uh, there may be a massive martyrdom event at the very end. There may be. But that tells us something. So let, let's just, let's just, play around with that. There's going to be 
different ways that we might leave this earth. One, we might leave through conventional methods. We might die of old age. I hope you do. Maybe illness or accident. I hope that's not the way. But we're, we're, we're familiar with that. Some of us may leave the earth through, uh, through rapture. And some of us may leave the earth because we die for Christ. And I want you to think about this because, I mean, we, we, we might get a little grossed out by this, but, but, but ready your heart just in case, okay? You know, to, to die, and, I, and maybe you've been, had the privilege of being present when somebody passes, sometimes it can be really peaceful. It can be a really beautiful thing, especially when somebody knows the Lord and they know exactly where they're going. But I, I imagine, even as I, as I get older and I think more about the, that day, and I, there's some parts of that. Honestly, the even natural death sounds kind of scary. I'd rather avoid it. <laughs> death by accident or illness, that's scary too. I've had the, the privilege in the last few weeks of um, working with the hospital chaplains to be on the ICU at the hospital to talk with staff and to pray over patients there. And there's folks in there on, on ventilators. It's scary. It's hard. It's one among a thousand reasons why we want to be right there with those medical workers and support them in every possible way we can. But, but some of us will die through accident or illness. And that's scary too. Or you, you think about uh, maybe if, if you were raptured, like, uh, you know, caught up into heaven. And you're, I don't know about you. I, I get afraid of heights after about 12 feet. Um, I have a feeling the process of that, of is what's going on? Why am I, I 10,000 feet in the air? Why am I flying through a cloud? I don't feel like I'm in control of anything. I think that would be scary, too. And by the way, to die for Christ... That would be scary, too. There's no way through this thing without facing something scary. That's my point. And there's a lot worse things that could happen than dying for Christ. In fact, there's one thing that is infinitely worse than dying for Christ. And that's dying apart from Christ. Fear the right things. Because whether we live or whether we die, whether we have many years on earth, whether the end times are coming in the next few years or whether it's centuries away, all of that are in the, is in the Lord's hands. And if you belong to Jesus, if you've asked Christ into your heart, you've, you've, you've received the forgiveness that has been offered to you through him and his sacrificial death on the cross, his victorious resurrection from the grave, if you've received that, you are marked, you are sealed, you are in God's hands. He's got you. He's got you. And so whether you live, whether you die, how you live, how you die, all of it is in his hands and he loves you like crazy. And he is redeeming the world. And so this calls for, this calls for the same thing that we've just heard about. This calls for patient endurance. That no matter what life throws at you, no matter, no matter how good or how bad or how scary or how easy life seems, we are called for, to patient endurance. Endurance. So would you ask God to build that kind of resilient faith in you? Because, you know, we do face real challenges in our time. We see a society becoming increasingly secular as fewer and fewer people are Christ followers. We see the Christian perspectives becoming less and less popular. So whether that's a Christian perspective on marriage, Christian perspective on gender, or Christian perspective on sanctity of life, or even how we pursue racial reconciliation and righteousness, 
there may be, it, it, it looks like we may be in a time where things are going to get harder. And so, friends, pay for, pray for, develop patient endurance. One of the ironies of history is this. Um, so so the, the, this early church, they, as far as we can tell from the evidence given to us it's in the book of Revelation, they really believed that Rome was, you know, was, was, this is the beast, and possibly you know, Nero is, is the, the number of the beast. And, and, the, and think about it. They're, living, they're, you know, they're, they're worshiping these tiny little house churches. They're, they're worshiping on their couch, like, like, like three-quarters of you, uh, you know, who are part of the worship service right now. You're sitting on your couch. It's a little house church. You're looking around. You're like, I don't know if I'm a part of anything big. This doesn't feel powerful. This doesn't feel influential. This feels hard. What difference does my life make? You know, it's, it's like, the, you know, those early, church, early Christians, they're living in the shadow of the Roman uh, temples and the, and the influence of the imperial cult is rising and rising and people are, are, are worshiping Caesar as, as, as a god. They're getting pushed out of the marketplace and they're thinking, what? This is horrible. And they were early church, as far as we can tell, they really believed that they were imminently in the end times, that Jesus was coming back right away because there's no way that the power of Rome could be stopped. This is the unstoppable beast. What can we do? What can a bunch of tiny little Jesus followers accomplish in this kind of an environment? But, but they heard the message and they lived with patient endurance. I want to show you a picture, okay? Would you put that final picture up on the screen? This is the picture in the Roman Colosseum. The same place where Christians were martyred, where they were literally thrown to the lions, where they were convinced, in, you know, that there was no way that a Christian could stand up against the force of Rome. And in that same Colosseum right now is probably the, in that same city right now, the city of Rome, there are more crosses per square foot than any other place in the world. 220 years later, look this up if, you're, if you doubt me. 220 years later, the absolutely unthinkable happened. That little movement of Christians, that little persecuted group of house churches, they won. They won. Now, it's, it was messy. And, you know, over history, you know, the church would start to act beast-like and it would take on politics and there's reformations. And, but, but let's just focus on this first part, okay? By the, by the influence of their character, by how they endured hardship, by the, by the influence of their lives, they won, and 220 years later, because of their grandkids, their great-grandkids, and their great-grandkids who saw how their grandma, how their grandpa, how their great-grandpa, how they endured hardship, how they trusted Jesus no matter what, without having to storm the capital, without having to try to, try to elect a better emperor. With, they won, and the entire stinking Roman Empire became Christian. So I want to assure you, church, see, if you are walking with Jesus, we have assurance for eternity. The mark cannot hurt you unless you give it, give in, in, until your heart, unless your heart turns away from Christ. But if, you, if you're abiding in him, you have nothing to fear. But even as our assurance for eternity is secured because of what Jesus did, if we actually get it right, when the church actually lives it out like the early church did, and they welcome in the, they welcome in the outcast and they, and they tend to the poor and they, and, they, and they care for the sick and they bring the children that had been abandoned by infanticide in the Roman Empire, they bring them into their homes and they raise them as their own children as they defend the... The, the lives of the vulnerable, 
as they lived out the things that Jesus told them to do. When we do this, when the church gets it right, not only do we have assurance of victory in eternity, but sometimes we, we get to win the culture war now too. So don't fight like a beast. You live by the sword, you die by the sword. You don't fight fire with fire. Fight fire with water. Don't fight like a beast, fight like a lamb. Fight like a lamb. Lock your heart on patient endurance. Now I realize this video is not going to go viral because I'm not spreading any fear. I'm not going to get 50,000 hits by the end of the day. But you know what, church? When we live for Christ, when we just patiently endure, may not make a difference today or tomorrow. But Jesus always wins. He always wins. Never forget that. So I, I want to close with a little prayer exercise, okay? Um, and this might sound just a little bit kitschy, uh, but I, I want you to feel your seal. Okay? I want you to feel your seal. If you belong to Jesus, you, you have the mark of God on your life. Now, you may not be able to physically see it, but, but you are sealed. You are sealed by the Holy Spirit. I want you to feel your seal. And, and for anyone here today who is uncertain about their walk with Jesus or you're watching me online, you're uncertain about your walk with Jesus, this could be the point where, where your eternity changes. So what I invite us to do is to, is to bow our heads together, okay? And, um, and I want to invite us to just to be laying some things out before the Lord. And at, at the end of each phrase, just under your breath, I'd like you to, whether it's pray these words exactly or something similar, just to say, but I belong to you, Jesus. I belong to you, Jesus. Let's pray. So I want you to think about some of the things that your heart longs for. Some of the things that you desire in life. What's, whatever success looks like in your life. I'd like you just to bring that to mind in prayer before the Lord. And Lord, may I never forget that I belong to you, Jesus. I want you to think about the things that you, that you might be um, scared of today, the thing that you fear, whatever that might be, that area of uncertainty. Just bring it, bring it before the Lord. And maybe it's a word picture in your mind. Maybe you want to name it under your breath. Lord, there are things in, my, in this life that I fear, but I belong to you, Jesus. I want you to think about the areas in your life that feel uncertain right now. So maybe that's politics, maybe that's something with the work, maybe that's something with family, something that just feels uncertain right now. Just bring it to the Lord. Whisper it under your breath, bring a word picture up in your mind, just somehow, he, he can, he, he can, whether you say it out loud or not, He can hear your thoughts. And as you bring that to mind, remind yourself that I belong to you, Jesus. Because no matter how far you have drifted, maybe you're the Satanist and you've got your, you, you've, you've actually got a, you've got a nasty tattoo literally on your forehead. You are one prayer away from his love. Or maybe you are uncertain about where you are in your, in your walk with the Lord today. And this could be that moment where you, where you reconnect your, you recommit your life, you reconnect the relationship. Just say it, just say it, just pray it, just talk to Him today. Because I belong to you, Jesus. So Lord, may we live as people of conviction, with people of patient endurance, because we belong to you. Jesus. Amen.